This program is brought to you by the combined resources of the Wisconsin Historical Society and Wisconsin Public Television. On Wisconsin Hometown Stories, a city founded on the Wisconsin River, built up by the harvest of a great pine forest and strengthened by a strong spirit of community. A city transformed by group investment and visionary efforts to put it on the map. On Wisconsin Hometown Stories, Wausau. Wisconsin Hometown Stories, Wausau is made possible in part by the family of Cyrus Yawkey. The Carolyn S. Mark Legacy Fund of the Community Foundation of North Central Wisconsin the B.A. and Esther Greenheck Foundation. Aspirus, a comprehensive health care system serving North Central Wisconsin and Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Ruder Ware. The Dudley Foundation. The Walter Alexander Foundation. And for curriculum development, the Judd S. Alexander Foundation. With additional support from these funders, including the Friends of Wisconsin Public Television and the Wisconsin History Fund, supported in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities. In 1838, an Eastern lumberman named George Stevens made his way up the Wisconsin River to see for himself whether the talk of a great pine forest was true. It's almost hard to imagine the world that he would have seen here in Wausau at the time. Really vast tracts of the white pine, this great white pine resource, one of the great resources in all of North America. And by about the early to mid 1830s, white settlers had come to realize just how vast a resource this was and begun to think about exploiting it. And so this is really the time in which the U.S. government began to take steps to sign treaties with the Indian peoples to take the land away from them. The land that is now Wausau proper was ceded by the Menominee in 1836. It was land that was at different times used by the Menominee, the Ojibwa, the Ho-Chunk, it's called informally the Indian Strip. And this was a strip uh, three miles on each side of the river, starting at Nakusa and going uh, north to Wausau. And that opened that strip of land to logging, but more importantly, it, it opened up the water power sites. Not only could the loggers log, they could set up water-powered sawmills so that the logs could be cut into simple planks, assembled into rafts, and then sent down river to market. And that's 1836, and it's really no coincidence that George Stevens shows up and begins to survey the area for lumber. Stevens came up with wagons uh, clear from Illinois, got them to Portage, transferred everything to uh, dug out canoes and went up to sort of a staging area that received its name of Stevens Point. Stevens traveled north and settled at a place called Big Bull Falls, which he described as the best mill site I ever saw or heard of. When you really talk about the founding of Wausau, it is above all else about the river. Big Bull Falls, which was the original name, is, was a large drop in the Wisconsin River that created power. But at the time, it was wild. Supposedly, the falls could be heard from miles away, both Big Bull Falls here, Little Bull Falls, and what's now Mosinee. The course of the river at that point was very complicated. And in fact, it's been changed dramatically. Uh, an old timer would not recognize it today. There were a number of channels, so it was a place where people could build their own mill and dam without a great deal of interference with others. And so it became a, a very large operation there very quickly. 
And then in addition, of course, to altering the river so that you could better utilize its power, you had to also move these log rafts on the river. And that was formidable. They would uh, make what was known as a crib to begin with. This was a uh, structure of crossed boards, and it was bound together by uh, wooden pegs, which were made out of saplings. For steering, they would have oars, one in the front and one in the back. The, uh, the fellow in the back did all the work, but the one in the front did the steering. And we're talking about oars of 40, 50 feet long, very heavy. The currents weren't necessarily straight. There were a lot of rocks, which uh, there was an attempts all the time to dynamite out. The Wausau had a a very large, famous one called <laughs> Lumberyard Rock. You can guess where it got its name. But when these cribs would go over a, a rapids, it would be quite common that the whole crib and the people would disappear for a few seconds for the first time. In other words, it would cover up the top of their heads and they would bob up, hopefully, and uh, carry on. Uh, a good share of them were young, inexperienced people. Uh, they couldn't swim. In a uh, period of uh, about a week at Wausau, 17 men drowned in uh, the area of Big Bull Falls. In the early years, it's a very small place. Even by the time of the Civil War, it doesn't have railroad connections yet. In some ways, except for the river, it's extremely isolated. But you have a lot of young men on the make, uh, men who realize the vast resources that the Pinery offers, and they're trying to make a new life and a better life for themselves. They came here to earn money. They also came here because they thought it was a new promised land. They were maybe coming from foreign countries like Germany or Poland. They were coming from the eastern part of the country. They were seeking new adventure. They were seeking freedom. They were seeking a new way of life. August Kickbush came from Germany, became a merchant. He owned some land also in Marathon County. August Kickbush is important because he went back to Germany after realizing that we needed a lot more workers here. So he went back to Germany, chartered a ship called the America, and brought back 700 German immigrants into central Wisconsin. And thus we start the vast immigration of Germans into Marathon County. A Scottish immigrant, Walter McIndoo, ventured up to Big Bull Falls and struck by the potential of the place, decided to make it his home. He was one of the early people in the 1850s that decided they really wanted to make this rough and tumble place a community. But what he did was to name the city, change the name from Big Bull Falls to Wausau, and, and uh, he did that because he didn't think it was sophisticated enough for this wonderful place. And he also gave land for the first courthouse but he was also instrumental in bringing the railroad to the area. He, he tried very hard to make it a better place to live and, and connected to other cities by the railroad. Well, when the first railroad, the Wisconsin Valley Line, reached Wausau in 1874, it was a huge moment in the life of the place. This gave a great shot in the arm uh, economically to Wausau because they saw the advantage of doing what uh, we call today value added. And that is they didn't ship down lumber, they shipped down uh, doors and sashes and all kinds of machined wood, finished wood. The railroads also opened up vast new areas of the North Woods to logging. The rate of the harvest was extraordinary and created tremendous wealth that would carry the city of Wausau into a new era. As the harvest of the white pine went on, Wausau lumbermen began to see that they would soon deplete the supply of the big trees. 
Well, I think in the 1890s, they were starting to realize that the white pine would not last forever. And Alexander Stewart, who was probably the wealthiest man, he was very worried that the economy was going to go into a great decline if they didn't do something about it. And so he gathered all of these men, uh, lumbering men that had moved here, and they decided that in order to live here and have a growing economy, they would have to diversify. And that gave rise to the Wausau Group. This group of investors poised to transform the local economy. The uh, Wausau Group was never a formal organization. It, basically a group of uh, industrialists who cooperated and uh, shared investments. Wausau Group members pooled their resources to invest in the growing lumber industry in states to the south. Walter Alexander, an early leader of the group, helped form the Wausau Southern Lumber Company, which built large sawmills and manufacturing plants to process the southern yellow pine. They, uh, they continued their lumbering, and, and particularly in Arkansas and Louisiana, later on in Mississippi. Many of them began to have timber interest in places like the Pacific Coast. The Pacific Northwest was a growing lumber region, and yet they decided to maintain this as their home. The fact that they, that they continued to operate their businesses from Wausau made it possible for them to continue to cooperate. One of the factors driving them, the desire not only to promote their economic interests, which was probably first and foremost, but also their desire to be able to stay where they were uh, and to have a future. And that, in turn, translated into a commitment to the future of the community. Though the white pine was running out, there was still plenty of hemlock, spruce, and other hardwood trees that were already being used in Wausau's sash and door companies, in a large wood veneer plant, and in other factories that made toothpicks and wooden packing boxes. To take advantage of this resource, the Wausau Group again pooled their money to make big investments in the new pulpwood papermaking industry. The uh, process used in paper manufacture up to about the 1880s or so uh, had been primarily the use of rags and fabrics to manufacture paper. And by the 1890s, the new wood-based technology had just begun to develop. With the help of paper makers from the Fox River Valley, the Wausau Group built a paper mill at Brokaw, five miles upriver. For the 175 mill workers, they built a company town with a company store. What the Wausau Group does is not unusual in the larger economic history of the period, where you have people who potentially were competitors in a market um, cooperating. The Wausau Group soon built another mill at Mosinee, which quickly brought new life to the community. In nearby Rothschild, the group built their biggest mill, the Marathon Paper Company. Construction on the huge project, which included a 450-foot dam, proceeded with the help of only one steam shovel. Workers completed the rest of the job by horse or by hand. To run the Marathon Mill, the Wausau Group recruited a young papermaker named D.C. Everest, who would eventually join the group. This group really had a genius for being able to pick very smart people. Everest's knowledge of the industry and premature baldness disguised the fact that he was only 25 years old. He soon became general manager of that plant and turned that into Marathon Corporation with holdings throughout North America. Cyrus Yawkey, the longtime president of Marathon Paper and a Wausau Group leader, moved his family to the city after more than a decade of running lumber companies further north. 
their friends all urged them to, to move to Wausau, and, which they did, and, and I always say it's a lucky thing they did because uh, Mr. Yockey was a very, very astute businessman. Yockey built an impressive home, now restored as a museum by the Marathon County Historical Society. This was a symbol of his success in the lumbering business and also in society. In his home office, Yawkey and members of the Wausau Group discussed their investments in local businesses, like the Wausau Street Railway Company. They dammed the river below Big Bull Falls for a hydroelectric plant and started a regional utility company. They formed the Marathon Electric Company to make electric motors and retooled the Murray Manufacturing Company, switching from making machines for sawmills to making machines for paper mills. But the group turned to a new industry in 1911, when the Wisconsin legislature passed the nation's first workman's compensation law to help address the rampant problem of industrial accidents. Neil Brown, a visionary member of the Wausau Group, persuaded them to form an insurance company to take advantage of the new law. This was a progressive law. This is really Wisconsin's progressive tradition that workmen should be protected and that they should be compensated if they're injured on the job. Not only is that part of the Wisconsin political tradition, but it's also very in line with the Wausau Group to see this new business opportunity and to move quickly into it. On the day the bill became law, Employers Mutual Insurance Company issued its first workers' compensation policy to another Wausau Group business, the paper mill in Mosinee. The company would go on to become a leading provider of business insurance and one of the Wausau Group's most successful ventures. There are always people of imagination and skill wherever you go, but I think the uniqueness here was that they, they were not independent operators. They tended to work together. And that produced, I think, better results than if that each one had gone off on his own. The members of the Wausau Group had pooled their skills and their money to transform the local economy. And their efforts would soon be joined by others to bring the area both statewide and national attention. It was the first flight across the Atlantic by Charles Lindbergh that created a new wave of aviation fever in Wausau. And Ben and Judd Alexander, second generation members of the Wausau Group, leased land to build the city an airport. Another couple of businessmen imported a, a well-known flyer from the east, his name was John Wood, and they brought him here to kind of ramrod their aviation operation and they became dealers of the Waco aircraft. But he was an air racer and he participated in long distance races. And up until this time, aviation was in, was in the barnstormer days. You know, the, the, those magnificent men in their flying machine and wing walkers and all of that. And that was fun, but it didn't do anything towards getting people who weren't flyers in the air. Ford Motor Company created what they called the Ford Reliability Tour to demonstrate the reliability of the aircraft of that day. And they would leave from Detroit and fly a predetermined route over a period of days and weeks and they had some scoring system that they had developed. And by the time the air tour had flown around the southern rim of the United States and gotten to Los Angeles,